Welcome everyone to the fifth session of our lecture series, Historic House Museums Respond to Crisis. I am Sheridan Small, the Director of Education here at Dumbarton House. Dumbarton House is a historic house museum located in Washington, D.C., and we're the headquarters of the National Society of the Colonial Dames of America. We share stories about life here in D.C. in the early 1800s through the lives of those individuals who have lived and worked here at the house, as well as share exhibitions and programs about the challenges and opportunities in historic preservation today. This is the fifth lecture in a six-part series funded by the National Trust for Historic Preservation. I encourage you to watch the other sessions if you have not already, as we have been exploring new topics and institutions each week as we learn how historic house museums have been responding in the last year or so to the urgent needs created by climate change, the COVID-19 pandemic, and social justice movements. Each session is recorded and available on our YouTube page, but by being here in the live presentations, you get to ask all our speakers your questions. So please feel free to put those in the chat throughout the program and we'll have a Q&A at the end. Back in June, Sarah Sutton started off this series by talking about some of the ways that historic house museums can help the public learn about and address climate change. Today, we continue that theme with a presentation on one site in particular, the Skya Museum and Garden in Miami, Florida. The Skya Museum and Gardens is a national historic landmark accredited by the American Alliance of Museums and a nonprofit owned by Miami-Dade County. The Skya has a staff of around 80 employees and a large core of volunteer guides. Pre-pandemic, the Skya saw just over 300,000 visitors a year, many of whom are domestic and international tourists. Remco Jansonius, the Deputy Director for Collections and Curatorial Affairs, joins us today to share how Vizcaya Museums and Gardens has been dealing with issues related to climate change, sea level rise, and environmental sustainability. Remco Jansonius received an MA degree in Cultural Anthropology from the University of Utrecht in the Netherlands. He conducted extensive field research in Cameroon and Papua New Guinea. After moving to the US, he held various collections management positions in museums in Miami, Florida. From 1997 to 2002, Remco served as an ethnographer for the Ford Foundation's multi-year, multi-site initiative, internationalizing new work in the performing arts. After receiving the Smithsonian Affiliations National Fellowship Award in 2001, he moved to Washington, D.C. for a residency and freelance work at the National Museum of Natural History. Remco returned to Miami to join the Sky Museum and Gardens in 2004. Since 2017, Remco has also served on the board of DEMHIST, the International Committee of Historic House Museums, one of the committees of ICOM, the International Council of Museums. Timely and related to the topic of today's presentation, the theme of the upcoming annual conference, conference of DEMHIST is Historic House Museums for a Sustainable World, Challenges and Opportunities. This virtual conference will take place October 4th through 8th of this year, and you can check it out at the link I will put in the chat. In today's presentation, Remco will weave together elements that are part of the original creation and fabric of this Gaia, as well as elements of, that determine the current context, including vulnerabilities and threats, especially hurricanes. We will talk about response and restoration, protection and mitigation, but also about the Skya's work to raise awareness on issues of climate change and environmental sustainability, including how the Skya is making its own internal practices more sustainable. And with that, I will pass it over to you, Remco. Thank you so much for joining us. I think you're muted. Uh, thank you, Sheridan. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you, Sheridan, for this introduction. And uh, thank you also for the invitation to participate in this series of uh, six talks. Um, also a big thanks to the National Trust for Historic Preservation to make this possible. So uh, I'm gonna start sharing my screen right away. And we're gonna start this tour of Iskaya. How's that? Looks like it's just loading. 
Great. Yes, we can see the slides. All right. There we go. So Vizcaya was built between 1914 and 1922. So it was built right at the end of this period in American history known as the Gilded Age. And this is when wealthy Americans built lavish estates. They looked back at Europe for inspiration and they, um, yet they were firmly planted in the America of the late 19th and early 20th century. Vizcaya's patron was James Deering. Uh, he was, a, again, wealthy agricultural industrialist, originally from South Paris, Maine. He was the vice president of International Harvester, the largest manufacturer of uh, agricultural machinery with a plant located in Chicago. Agriculture was uh, both at the focus of Deering's career, it was also the source of the family's wealth. And with that, agricultural, uh, agriculture was and is very much an element at the foundation of Vizcaya's story. When Deering retired in uh, 1908 from International Harvester, he set out to build a winter residence in South Florida. Now for historic context, um, it's important to realize that the city of Miami um, which is to the immediate north of Vizcaya, where you find now, today you find um, downtown Miami. The city was incorporated only in 1896. So this was about 10 years before Deering started to purchase land for Vizcaya. Uh, looking a little closer at the location of Vizcaya, Deering wanted to build his house right along the shore of Biscayne Bay. This was an unusual choice because much of his inspiration for the estate uh, he got from Roman villas and Renaissance villas in Italy, and these were built usually further inland. And also when you look at the contemporaries of Vizcaya, the, uh, the cottages, the, the mansions in Newport, Rhode Island, these usually are located also at a, a certain distance, a safe distance from the water's edge. But not so for Vizcaya, as you can see here. Um, Deering's architect and his contractors advised against it, but he insisted that Vizcaya be built a mere 125 feet or so from the water's edge. Now, this meant <clears throat> that um, not only the site for the house, but also the, uh, the terraces and part of the gardens had to be raised uh, several feet to rise above the level of high tide. And mind you, this was high tide of the 1910s. So anyway, Deering insisted, and this is how it happened. And uh, this is really where part of the trouble starts. And I will get back to that in a moment. When you look at the geology of South Florida, or at least the part of where Miami is, uh, where uh, Vizcaya is built, you'll see a limestone elevation, the so-called Silver Bluff. It's uh, several hundred feet from the water's edge, and this would have been a logical place for uh, to build a house. But as I mentioned, Deering wanted to build this house closer to the water, but he also wanted to preserve this forest that uh, on top of this limestone ridge. And um, what it was to, to, um, to, to keep this natural area with the mind of a preservationist, or maybe because he wanted to create a privacy buffer between his house and the outside world. Either way, uh, now we have an endangered Rockland hammock as part of the Vizcaya estate. And this is an ecosystem that we continue to preserve today. Looking to the other side of the estate, uh, bordering Biscayne Bay, we find a long stretch of mangrove shoreline. And most of this Deering also preserved, which, was, which is also a good thing because um, mangroves play an important role in protecting uh, shorelines from, from erosion during a storm. Uh, they fill the trash, they uh, serve as a nursery for shrimp and fish, and they also support endangered and threatened species. So how much of this Deering was aware of at the time, we don't know, but uh, we know that uh, today still this mangrove shoreline 
plays an important role in preserving the estate and it adds to the biodiversity of Iskaya. Now looking south, uh, we find the formal gardens. Uh, these European inspired gardens are an entirely artificial construct. Uh, you see concrete walls for, for the ponds, uh, retaining walls for uh, raised terraces, and even towards the end of the formal gardens, uh, you see this in the photo on the right, we find a mound with a small structure, the casino on top of it, and um, live oak trees that uh, even at the time of construction, they were uh, well over, they were very mature trees. So this mound is also entirely man-made. And then looking further south, um, south of the formal gardens, you find the, the lagoon gardens or you found the lagoon gardens. This was an extensive area of um, waterways and islands, but none of these gardens exist anymore. They were sold in the late 1940s and uh, the man-made lagoons were filled in. And today we find a church and a school and a hospital on this land. So I'm not going to get further into the gardens, but we're going to the main house. The main house consists of a basement, a ground floor with decorated rooms, a second floor with daring suite and guest bedrooms, and then there, were two there are two towers with additional guest rooms. Uh, also on the second floor and on, on a mezzanine level, there are spaces for uh, back of house functions and servants' bedrooms, and they serve today as uh, staff offices. An important design element of Iskai's main house is the connection between inside and outside, between the gardens and um, the interior of the house. Except for the north side, which is really looking to the left here, but uh, the, the southeast and west sides of the house each feature a large loggia, very airy, with high ceilings and a great view of the hardwood hammock, the formal gardens and the waters of Biscayne Bay. And these loggias lead to colonnaded arcades. And these in turn open up to, the, to a very spacious courtyard. And originally this courtyard was open to the elements. Now just imagine how this must have been, uh, whether it was sunny or breezy or rainy, um, the, 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 this open, open courtyard uh, provided this great, great sense and continuation from inside to outside. And even if you were there, uh, you were really um, in, in, in the heart of the house, but feeling outside. And this is really how James Deering experienced his home for the winter months until his death in 1925. Um, his, uh, the family members who, in, who inherited the estate maintained it as such until uh, the late 1940s and then finally in 1952 when they transferred Vizcaya to Miami-Dade County. And at this time Vizcaya became a public museum. So after about 30 years as a public museum, all this changed when air conditioning was installed and a skylight was installed over the courtyard. At the time, this was uh, much maligned by many because uh, they, they saw it as destroying the original architectural integrity of the house. But it was considered a necessity to preserve the, uh, the antique furnishings in the rooms but also to provide a more comfortable environment for visitors. But by the early 2000s, this uh, skylight was badly in need of replacement. Uh, there were frequent leaks and also it was no longer up to code. Fiskaya is located in a, a high velocity hurricane zone. And this means that um, uh, everything about the building's envelope, including um, doors and windows, the roof and the skylight, everything has to incorporate uh, lab tested and wind resistant design and materials. So we briefly considered leaving the courtyard open, very briefly, 
um, because that's how it was intended to be. But uh, it was a short-lived consideration because the courtyard is a very important place for the 80 or so facility rentals that take place at Vizcaya every year. And as you can imagine, uh, these facility rentals provide a large part of Vizcaya's earned revenue. So in the end, we came up with a new design that closely resembles the old sky, skylight. Now up to coat with larger glass panes, filtering UV, blocking heat with thinner support columns and uh, um, generally speaking, a lighter frame that is visually, visually, visually less intrusive, sorry. And with this skylight, uh, of course, since the 1980s, we lost a lot of uh, this feel of inside outside connection, but since uh, 2012 12, with this lighter skylight, we have been able to recreate some of that feeling because we are able to maintain much uh, lusher and healthier vegetation in the courtyard as you see in this image. Now, before we go back to the waterfront, a quick side trip to the village. Uh, James Deering's idea for a village was also uh, inspired by estates in uh, Northern Italy. So um, similarly, the Vizcaya village and, and its functions and buildings were designed to support the estate and make it uh, pretty much self-sufficient. There was a, um, a poultry house, a mule barn, uh, greenhouses, a dairy barn, uh, agricultural fields, orchards, etc. Originally, Vizcaya covered some 180 acres, but over time, this has been re reduced to about 50 acres. So now that you know a little bit the lay of the land of Vizcaya, um, let's talk about hurricanes. It is unlikely that James Deering ever experienced a hurricane prior to building Vizcaya. It was not until 1926, one year after his death, that the so-called Great Hurricane of Miami, um, uh, the Great Miami Hurricane, yes, that it struck South Florida and it caused massive destruction across the region and major damage to Vizcaya as well. Now, many hurricanes have struck South Florida since then. Um, there are many variables, including strength and speed, uh, time of year, where it makes landfall, etc. But in spite of these variables, the damages are often similar and they show where Vizcaya's vulnerabilities are. There is, of course, hurricane force wind. It strips trees, it takes down branches or entire trees, it causes roof damage, and more than once windows or friends' doors have been forced open, resulting in damage, and not only from the wind itself, but also uh, from the uh, salt water spray that is deposit, deposited on all the furnishings. And then there is flooding. Uh, both from rain, but also uh, from storm surge that often accompanies a hurricane. And with storm surge, uh, large quantities of the debris are deposited in the gardens. This includes uh, branches, muck, seaweed, many flip-flops, and as my colleague Ian likes to say, they never match. Uh, mattresses, coolers, even a uh, jet ski. And removing this debris is time consuming and very costly. Now, there is no doubt that flooding will become more frequent and more severe. And uh, we already see that uh, happening in neighborhoods in Miami. Uh, people live um, in areas that are dealing with flooding of their streets, of their businesses, of their homes with each occurrence of king tide. Um, and let alone uh, if a high tide or a king tide is accompanied by a storm. So let's have a look at what this could happen for, uh, what, what this could mean for Vizcaya. Um, new share, get, give me a moment.
Do you see the sea level rise viewer? Yes. Great. So this is a site from uh, NOAA, the um, National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration. And it is a great interactive site where um, for the uh, east board, for the, the, the east coast of uh, the United States, you can find sites. They are highlighted with a drop of water. So we are going to Miami and we see Vizcaya here. So um, let me go back to like this. So on the left, you see a, um, a slide which you, as you move it, you see the impact in the, uh, on the map of what sea level rise means for South Florida, for the land. And in the little window, you see what it means of his, for Vizcaya. This is the, uh, these are the steps leading towards the Upper East Terrace and two feet, three feet, four feet of sea level rise, you see the water appearing. And as this water appears towards the East Loggia, this means that the basement under the uh, East Loggia basically has been inundated already. Uh, it, this is a great site. I, I encourage you to explore it and um, find other sites across the uh, East Coast of the United States. Stop sharing this. I lost the entire share now. Am I back? Yes. Great. Uh, slideshow, sorry about this. No worries. Technology, right? Mm -hmm. Slideshow from current slides. Why is this not happening? Okay, there we go. So, um, so as I as I indicated with that uh, uh, sea level slider, uh, one particular particularly vulnerable area at Fiskai has been uh, the basement of the main house. It was first flooded in 1926, and the recreational rooms, including the billiard room and the bowling alley, were uh, damaged, destroyed, and never uh, brought back to their original state. And in the uh, 15 plus years since I've been at Vizcaya, this has happened twice more, flooding the cafe and gift shop that now occupy these spaces. But it also damaged and disabled much of the mechanical systems that are housed in the basement. So after Hurricane Wilma in 2017, the main house was without reliable power or air conditioning for a number of weeks. Um, attempts to keep mold at bay were mostly successful in the decorated rooms, but in other areas, there were uh, major and recurring mold outbreaks, and eventually this required professional cleanup. And then there is the combination <clears throat> of forces of water and wind, uh, which have ca caused significant damage along the waterfront. The pavers of the boat landing have been knocked around and uh, uh, disappeared into the water. Uh, the tea house was already in bad, uh, bad condition and um, the entire lattice dome was taken down. And then a third waterfront feature, the barge also saw major damage. Now this photo was taken on a beautiful day, um, better times, 2010. This um, on the left side, the barge, uh, this is an iconic structure uh, built in 1917 and uh, it is both a folly and it also serves as a uh, go figure, as a breakwater. It features uh, a series of sculptures by late 19th, early 20th century artist, uh, Alexander Sterling Calder. And with the help of a time-lapse camera installed on James Deering's balcony that overlooks the water, we were able to document the storm. And are you seeing the... Um... I think you have to switch the uh, screen to select the internet browser to share. 
How's this? Yes, we see that. Okay. So this, this short clip, it's about 40 seconds, shows the height of the storm and um, there's no sound to this. But you will see that uh, during the height of the storm, there's some red circles appearing of uh, some of the architectural features, the sculptures that are being taken down. The first one was one of the urms in the center, then some of the balustrades are being taken down. And then um, the obelisk is cut in half. But it's not all doom and destruction in spite of what I'm showing here. We are, I have to share this again. Sorry about that. Uh, now I have to do this again. So um, we are learning both about response and recovery, but also we are getting better at hurricane preparation. Our plan for the disaster preparation, response and recovery is getting more voluminous every year. And uh, that's a direct reflection of the increased urgency to be well prepared, but also of the lessons that we learn every year every with every disaster. Sorry, I'm gonna start again. How's this? It's just loading. There you go, perfect. One more, there we are. So um, I'm gonna give you a few examples of how we prepare, how we're getting better at it, and how we impact uh, for a next, uh, how we uh, mitigate the impact of a next storm, which is not really uh, a matter of if, but a matter of when, and even a matter of how soon. So we have a cyclical maintenance schedule for tree trimming. And this means that we are not trimming right before a storm, but that this is an ongoing activity. <clears throat> it prevents branches from becoming projectiles and damaging the sculptures in the gardens. And um, additionally, we have started doing sonic tomography on some trees. And this is a method to determine the structural integrity of a tree, which in turn helps us determine uh, how to, to uh, trim the trees. And altogether, this, this maintenance approach has uh, proven to be quite successful. While there was severe damage to sculptures caused by Hurricane Wilma in 2005, damage from Hurricane Irma in 2017 was limited to just one. The swan of Leda broke its neck and lost its head. Also, since uh, Hurricane Wilma in 2015, we have permanently installed thick aquarium glass windows in the cafe and um, gift shop at the basement level. Together with uh, submarine doors at all entry points, we should be better equipped to keep water out of the basement. Additionally, the electrical panels have been uh, moved up several feet uh, just in case that there is flooding, that they will not be flooded and cut off power to our mechanical systems. Now, earlier on, I mentioned that Fiskaya is in a high velocity hurricane zone. Um, so to bring Fiskaya, to bring the main house up to code, we, are, uh, we have just completed the uh, replacement of the roof on the main house. And in the next year or two, we are going to replace and bring up to code windows and doors of the main house. And this is a much needed project because the, um, 
the hurricane shutters that are currently installed are not only unsightly, they are also have started to fail. <clears throat> then finally, um, as you can imagine, the air conditioning systems for Vizcaya's main house um, are a big um, operation, many parts in many locations, and some of the air handling units are located in the basement, which, as I showed, is prone to flooding. Indeed, they were flooded and destroyed during Hurricane uh, Irma three years ago. Since then, they have been uh, replaced and um, these new units are more efficient, they are smaller, they are easier to access and to maintain, and they are also made of a material, material that in case of flooding can easily be hosed off. Now, a new method of uh, protection, and uh, this is something that Sarah spoke, Sarah Sutton spoke about several weeks ago. This is um, the uh, Tiger Dam system. Basically, it consists of uh, large vinyl tubes that are being filled with water prior to a storm, uh, in the case of Iskaya with uh, bay water and stacked on top of each other, anchored to the ground, they provide a barrier that uh, is supposed to keep the water out of the basement and water and debris out of the gardens also. It's been um, a very, uh, it's been very costly to purchase this, uh, but, uh, and it, it's gonna take some major effort to install it prior to an approaching storm. But if installed properly, it should uh, mean major cost savings because we will not be dealing with the same amount of uh, water damage, uh, flooding damage and uh, debris that needs to be removed. Now, let me talk a little bit about uh, restoration and mitigation. Following a storm, uh, after initial response and recovery, we embark on a restoration campaign. This tends to be slow, time-consuming, complicated, and costly. We work with Miami-Dade County, uh, which owns Vizcaya, and we also work with FEMA. So between a local government and a federal agency, we are presented with processes and procedures and uh, requirements that are extremely complex to begin with. Uh, they are subject to change and also they are not always in sync with each other. But, you know, considering the large amounts of money that are uh, at stake through various um, uh, reimbursement and funding programs, uh, we definitely sign on for this. And um, as far as specifically, as far as mitigation, I want to talk a little bit about uh, the waterfront features. One may ask the question, and we do get this question, you know, why bother restoring if during uh, a next storm the same damage will occur, occur the same restoration is needed? Uh, so really, why bother? It's a valid question, and uh, especially considering how costly restoration is. So rather than just restore, we explore and we implement mitigation uh, measures to better preserve and protect the um, architectural and artistic features of Vizcaya, but also to implement cost savings on the long run. So I'll give two examples of this. As I mentioned before, the boat landing was um, destroyed during Hurricane Irma, as well as during previous storms, especially 2005 during Wilma. Now, rather than restore it the way it was originally constructed during uh, the most recent campaign, which, which uh, was completed just during the past couple of months, we installed, and you see that top left, a geotextile liner uh, um, along the inside of the structure. Uh, and this is meant to prevent fill from leaking out in case there is some damage to the structure. And then on top of that, we placed a um, reinforced concrete, concrete slab. Uh, it, it serves more or less as a lid to keep it all together. And then the coral rock pavers were uh, mortared onto that slab. And at the bottom right, you see the completed uh, uh, boat landing after restoration, which um, I have to say is looking quite handsome. Another example is um, 
uh, uh, is with the four urns that are on the boat landing. These are um, the, the sculptures by Alexander Sterling Calder. They've been knocked off their pedestals uh, more than once over the 100 plus years of, of storms and hurricanes. But rather than continuing to salvage them and, and uh, restore them and losing some of the details of the sculptures with, with uh, each of these occurrences, we have decided to take them down, uh, the three that are still up, to replicate them and then re, uh, reinstall their, their replicas. Uh, we're going to keep the originals in safe storage and ultimately we will use those for exhibit and uh, interpretation purposes. So while both of these measures are certainly more costly at this time, uh, in the end they are meant to preserve and protect these features and to provide cost savings in the long run. Now let's move on. and talk about some programming. Now, as I mentioned before, uh, we are getting better at disaster preparation. We are learning from every disaster. But that being said, we will never be experts on sea level rise or climate change. We just don't have that science in house. But um, what we can do is to take advantage of the unique position of Iskaya. Here, history, art, and the environment converge, and this spot illustrates so well uh, what the impact of climate change and sea level rise can be on, um, on heritage and on our community. So what we can do is to provide a location and a platform to bring these, these issues to the forefront, to bring people together and to raise awareness through this programming. Over the years, we have partnered uh, with a wide array of community organizations and presented or facilitated programs on a range of topics. And I will share a few examples of this. Uh, in 2016, Vizcaya partnered with the local Frost Museum of Science and Ocean Scientists at the University of Miami to figure out where the origin, wh what is the origin of trash that, um, that we find in Biscayne, Biscayne Bay and that uh, washes upon the shore. Now this partnership resulted in a series of ex experiments conducted over a period of uh, three years, large numbers of drift cards, which you see in the top left, were released by students in the waters of Biscayne Bay and uh, these drift cards were each imprinted with instructions how to report when someone found one. And also GPS equipped drifters were released to track the currents in Biscayne Bay. And that's the result of that you see in the top right image. So through these experiments, we found that some drift cards got carried out following the Gulf Stream into the North Atlantic, but most uh, remained in the bay. And this really indicated that trash that happens in Biscayne Bay stays in Biscayne Bay. And through this program, we engaged over a dozen environmental and community organizations. Hundreds of students were involved in the release of the drift cards. Dozens of citizen scientists reported on cards having uh, been found. So really by talking trash, the project raised awareness about uh, ocean science, it, um, about the impact of pollution, and it provided opportunities for collaboration on climate issues with a focus on keeping our own Biscayne Bay clean. Another type of engagement <clears throat> through a different medium and targeting different audiences has been through Biscay's Contemporary Arts Program. Through this program, we have invited artists over some 10 years or so to create and present projects or performances or installations that provide visitors with a different lens through which to experience Vizcaya. So several years ago, we commissioned Lucinda Lindemann to create work that uh, somehow interprets places or stories of Vizcaya that no longer exist. 
uh, Lucinda often works with uh, fabric and upcycle trash. And for this installation, uh, mapping sea level rise, she used the remnants of two large wooden wall-mounted map racks. Uh, 100 years ago, they were used to display maps of South Florida and the surrounding waters. She created maps made with different colors lint. Uh, of the Vizcaya estate, of the Everglades and um, waters around South Florida, showing what, what the region will look like at different stages of sea level rise in, in, in another 100 years. Another program is Vizcaya's urban farming school programs. Uh, we bring students to Vizcaya, uh, to the village and to the, um, to the kitchen garden and uh, we, uh, we are able to make connections between people, edible plants and place. In addition to hands-on activities, students learn about the history of farming in Miami-Dade County and in, uh, at Vizcaya. And then they um, uh, learn about the journey that uh, fruits and vegetables make from the origin, wherever they are grown uh, and eventually end up on their dinner plate in Miami. So uh, we talk about the environmental impact of transporting foods, but also about the possibility uh, to reduce carbon footprint by growing locally. As I mentioned before, we are planning to restore the uh, 12 acres of the historic uh, Vizcaya village. This will give us the opportunity to expand our urban farming program, but also to uh, further implement Vizcaya's mission to, and I quote, engage people in connecting with the past, understanding the present and shaping the future. So it's really um, where climate, uh, climate awareness and environmental sustainability are at the core of what we are trying to accomplish. Now, there are many other programs that uh, I uh, that we have been involved with. I skipped this one, but th uh, this one I want to mention. It is um, a program that took place in August of 2018. Um, it was a partnership with several organizations, including um, the Clio Institute. Uh, the Clio Institute is a nonprofit dedicated to climate crisis education and advocacy. So this program took the form of a town hall where people were talking about PTSD and, and health issues as a result of cli the climate crisis. And they talked about climate gentrification. And this is a topic that is getting more and more attention uh, in, in Miami and elsewhere as the impact of sea level rise on real estate and on neighborhoods is being felt more and more and uh, being felt the most by people who have the least options to address it. So this is really a good example of, um, you no, know, we are not the experts on climate change or sea level rise, but we can provide this platform to uh, discuss these and, and related issues and uh, the impact that they have on our community. Now, finally, Raising awareness about climate issues and environmental sustainability is not only a matter of uh, outreach. We also need to raise such awareness internally among staff and improve our own internal practices. So in 2018, Vizcaya joined We Are Still In. Um, this initiative brought together businesses and cities, universities, cultural organizations, including museums, uh, with the goal that by signing on these entities across the United States uh, made a pledge to commit to the principles of the Paris Climate Accord. Mind you, this was at a time that the US administration had stepped out of this agreement. And for Vizcaya, it was very important to make this public pledge to show internal commitment to start working towards um, environmental sustainability and to get some traction across the organization. We brought in Sarah Sutton to uh, consult with us uh, for a day on how to get started on this work. And Sarah Sutton is the cultural sector lead for um, We Are Still In, which is now called America is All In. 
Now, also, a group of Vizcaya employees visited a local recycling plant. Um, it's amazing to see this in action. Um, it, it really does raise one's awareness. It raised my awareness of what happens with each and every item that you either throw into the trash or into a recycling bin. We included green practice in our vision statement, which now reads, Biscaya is an enduring, inclusive and innovative place that inspires people to embrace the cultural vitality and environmental sustainability of the world around us. We established a cross-departmental committee to set goals for Vizcaya's operations. For example, we have switched to almost exclusively LED lights. We have implemented recycling for staff and for the cafe and gift shop. Uh, we have a, com a composting program for garden and kitchen waste. And we have switched from gasoline, and to, from gasoline to electric for leaf blowers and uh, golf carts. Now, um, very importantly, we are working uh, towards having different individuals in different departments um, as responsibles to advance these goals. And this would really make this environmental sustainability a truly institution-wide endeavor. We have also included this work in our strategic plan with concrete and measurable goals. For example, uh, with a baseline of two, the 2017 18 fiscal year, we has, have set goals uh, for something as simple as reducing the use of plastic water bottles. Uh, and with the same baseline, we are keeping track of and we are uh, reducing our energy use first for one part of the estate and then including other buildings as well. Now, while it may seem that the pandemic has um, put issues of climate change and environmental sustainability on the back burner, we have actually been able to advance some of this work. And I'm sure that some of this will sound familiar to you. Uh, working remotely has, um, has um, eliminated the commute for many colleagues. Uh, and now as we explore hybrid work schedules, we may be able to continue to reap some of these uh, green benefits. Uh, Online meetings and, and all communications happening electronically, we have uh, reduced our paper use. Uh, we no longer print maps for our visitors, they're digital. And also we have transitioned to online ticket sales. This was something that we had um, on our goals for a long time. Um, we, we really had anticipated it, but it was really the pandemic too that uh, pushed us to implement this. So um, we have, we have a, I'm gonna stop sharing here. No, I'm not gonna stop sharing, not yet, sorry. So uh, we have uh, come a long way to, be, uh, to becoming a truly environmentally sustainable organization. But I remember well a comment that uh, Sarah Sutton made during that uh, one day consultancy with us. Uh, and I'm not even paraphrasing, but it, it came down to, you know, every step is a step forward, no matter how small the step is. It can be daunting, it can be discouraging to look climate change and sea level rise in the face, uh, especially considering what we hear almost every day about um, extreme weather situations, about climate disasters around the country and around the globe. But um, you know we can make a difference uh, and we can move the needle um, both through our work internally and through outreach. And that's really what we are working on. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marmko, for your presentation. It's so fascinating to see the evolution of the estate and how it's both a historic house museum, you know, talking about this history, but then also the present challenges and how we can kind of shape our future. So I think that is just a great example of how historic house museums can um, focus on different periods, right? Um, not just history in the past, but also how 
um, that history effects are present and we can shape our future. So thank you so much. Um, everyone, if you have questions, please put those in the chat and we have some time to get to them. Um, I'll start off with a few questions, if you don't mind. So um, my first question is about the experience a visitor has when they come for, you know, a historic house tour, or, you know, they're there to see the, the site. How do they encounter um, your discussions of climate change? I've seen a couple of photos, the uh, contemporary arts program, but is it also woven into any other part of your interpretation? Um, yes, it, it is woven somewhat into um, both in, in our audio tour and in some of our uh, labels also. <clears throat> For example, um, uh, it happens quite often, uh, depending on the tide and, the, and the, the weather, that we have large amounts of trash in the, the basin um, immediately between the, the, the terrace and the barge. And there is often a lot of trash in the, um, in the mangroves. So, uh, and, and our visitors complain about the smell of it. And, and they, they may think that we are not keeping well care of the, uh, of the um, situation, but it actually is an opportunity to tell them both about, you know, where this trash comes from and also, um, you know, that this, this is historically happening, there's more trash happening now. And uh, yeah, it's an opportunity to, to talk about some of these things. Thank you. Um, and then my next question is kind of broadening the topic. So um, this guy obviously has to deal with issues around climate change because of its location. But um, what would you recommend for sites that may have less pressing, um, less of a pressing relationship to climate change, but nevertheless, it affects us all? What would you recommend for those sites if they want to kind of join the conversation or get started? with hosting similar discussions or projects at their sites? Do you, it's, it's a very broad question, um, which is kind of avenues to, to look at for places who may not be doing this quite yet. Well, uh, first of all, I kind of envy a place like that. <laughs> if it is less pressing, Mm -hmm. um, and, and yeah, you can join the conversation and you can, you can educate yourself about what the issues really are. And um, yeah, for Vizcaya with sea level rise, with, with hurricanes, the hurricane season is in full swing now. Uh, it is a very pressing issue, but uh, it plays out across the country, whether it is um, in, along the West Coast or the East Coast or in in, um, in, in um, the Midwest, weather patterns are changing, weather pa patterns are becoming more extreme. Um, read up on it, uh, join the conversation and, and see how this might impact your, um, your institution. And there is actually, since this question comes up, I don't know if, if you can see this. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's with a, with a virtual background. It's a little difficult. This is a book, uh, Environmental Sustainability at Historic Sites and Museums, written by Sarah Sutton. It's already a few years old, but it, oh, and actually on the front cover is Dumbarton. Dumbarton. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's a great book to, to kind of open your mind what climate change and environmental issues mean for your house museum. Um, and, and how, how you might join this conversation. That's a great recommendation. Thank you. So kind of similarly along those lines, um, as you know, the, the world continues to heat up, storms would get worse and all of uh, that. Um, do you think that a disaster plan, kind of contingency plan will soon become something that every museum needs to have alongside you know, their collections management policy and their interpretive plan? Hold on, soon? I think it's already <laughs> a requirement um, for, for every museum. And, uh, you know, I may have changed sometimes a hurricane plan, the word hurricane plan, and sometimes a disaster plan. You know, there are so many types of disasters that we need to be pre prepared for. And, and, and truthfully, um, 
yeah, hurricanes or extreme weather is one type of disaster, but the pandemic itself is is a type of disaster that we also need to be prepared for. Whether it is you know something like sudden loss of of revenue or um, you, need, you know you need to um, switch around the entire way that people navigate through your through your house or through your gardens. Uh, th this is also something that we learn about and parts of that can be incorporated into a um, disaster preparation plan. And also I should add that uh, for many years, <clears throat> we've been focused on uh, disaster preparation, but there also needs to be a good plan for disaster response and disaster recovery. Absolutely. Thank you for tying that back to the pandemic. Uh, this lecture series is, after all, entitled Historic House Museums Respond to Crisis, so it's meant to be um, general in its, in its overall messaging, so I appreciate that connection. And, and I if, think, if I may yeah. um, uh, add something to this, um, when Sarah Sutton spoke, um, what was it, eight weeks ago or so, she actually tied in these different crisis, the pandemic and the uh, so, uh, social mm -hmm. and racial injustice and climate change, that uh, they are not separate disasters. They uh, occur at the same time. And our response, uh, responses are over, can be overlapping and should be overlapping as well. So that, that's an interesting thing to, to uh, go back to, to her presentation. Absolutely. Thank you for that reminder. Uh, so kind of along those lines, I think that the pandemic has been the first time a lot of museums have been even thinking of the idea of disaster plans and also doing things in the digital realm. And so I thought the example you gave of the 3D scanning of the Herms was really fascinating. What do you see as the role of um, digital technology in historic preservation moving forward? Do you think it will play a large role in preserving these sites and artifacts or what do you think? Yeah, I think it, it's becoming more uh, common for, um, for historic houses to, to use this technology. And uh, we, we have been in, involved in this for a few years now. Um, that site virtualviscaya.org uh, gives some really good examples of um, 3D scanning of both the Barts and also our swimming pool grotto with a, um, a ceiling by um, Robert Winthrop Chandler. Um, but also, so th th this 3D scanning helps us with um, documentation which in turn can help us with uh, restoration, preservation, replication also, but also both the swimming pool grotto and the barts are not accessible to our visitors. So they can see up close these, these, uh, these great artistic features of Iskaya in a uh, virtual format. So that's really a double, double uh, benefit of this, um, this 3D documentation. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much. That about wraps up our time. Um, so I just want to end with a couple of other reminders. So one is uh, for people to please fill out the survey in the chat that will also open up when you close your Zoom screen. So you don't have to click on that link. Um, but if you're interested in this conversation about historic preservation and sustainability, I encourage you to also check out Dumbarton House's program calendar because um, in the next few months we'll have some more um, lectures about historic preservation and how it's often, you know, the sustainable and socially responsible thing to do instead of building a new building, how can historic preservation um, benefit communities and the world. Uh, but sooner than that, in two weeks, we have our last session of this series um, on the Nina Simone Childhood Home in North Carolina and how um, the National Trust for Historic Preservation is working with the community to save that home and open it to the public. So please join us for that and have a wonderful rest of your two weeks. Thank you again, Remco. Thanks, Sheridan. Thanks, everyone.